Welcome to the ninth week of Psych 9A, PSP 11A. We are 80% of the way there, which is a good round number. At the end of class today, we'll be 85% of the way there. Well, what I'd like to do is continue with uh, Chapter 5. We're effectively halfway through. Where I left off with last time was a discussion of uh, motion processing by the visual system. Uh, today, what I'd like to talk about are uh, some facets of visual neuroscience and what it can teach us about visual perception and a little bit more on shape processing. But before I go to those two topics, I want to finish up with a look at motion perception. So there was one thing that didn't work on my computer last time and I realized after researching this that it's due to the fact that this computer needs a new operating system. So that will happen at some point, maybe not this quarter. But I found a different way to show what it is I wanted to show you. And there it is. Did anybody uh, follow this link uh, from the lecture notes? This is actually a very fun thing. What we've got is one of these Gunnar Johansson point light walkers. And you can see that we now have sort of a computer simulation of a person walking in a dark room who has little lights attached to all of the joints. And I think you'll agree uh, that it is almost automatic the way that we perceive there to be a person uh, causing the motions of those lights. Now what's sort of fun is that we can uh, vary the way that these points are moving. And let's try a little bit that way. A little bit that way some more. Oh, there we go. Now we've got an action movie star. And we'll rotate that a little bit. So I, what I did was I moved the gender over to the right side and that happens to uh, give an exaggerated uh, male walk. And there we are. Now what do you suppose happens if I now move this back to the center and then to the left side? Here's our central gender walk. Now we'll go over to the left side. Ooh. <laughs> Again, this is exaggerated, but I think there's no doubt in our minds that this is capturing gender really well uh, of the person walking. Uh, that's neutral right here. There's the tough guy. There's uh, our female gender. And you know, we can rotate this around. And I, this is a uh, shockwave flash. So if you're able to play this yourself, do try this one. It's a lot of fun. The whole point is uh, we have a lot of very specialized motion processing uh, neurons in our visual systems that help us make sense of motion. And by make sense of motion, uh, we often can use motion to identify things, uh, which is not something we would necessarily expect. Again, uh, if you know somebody really well and you attach the little lights to their joints and watch them walk in a dark room, you'll be able to recognize that actual individual person, your friend, your mother, something like that. Uh, so it's really quite a fine thing. Again, it's uh, Gunnar Johansson who was the first to explore this sort of thing systematically. So a couple words now about eye movements. Uh, we make eye movements all the time. And the eye movements that we make all the time effectively are looking from one point, very rapidly zooming to a second point, very rapidly zooming to a third point. We don't necessarily stare at something for a long time. No, our eyes are sort of bopping around from one scene, from point in the scene to the next. The very rapid eye movements that we make from one point in the scene to the next are called saccades. And these are extremely rapid movements of the eyes and normally we are not aware that we are making these movements. Uh, in this picture below, <clears throat> we have a trace of how a person uh, moved uh, their eyes when viewing this picture. And for 216 milliseconds, the person looked at this point. Then they made a saccade over to that location, stayed there for 340 milliseconds, made a saccade to this location, 154 milliseconds, bop, bop, bop. And effectively, this is a trace of those eye movements that a person is making. Uh, and we make these all the time and we're 
They are very natural and we're almost unaware of making them all of the time. Now that's pretty interesting. Uh, and the reason it's interesting is that whenever you make an eye movement, so if I were to say look over to this side, the entire visual world shifts on my retina. And when you make an eye movement, the entire world shifts on your retina. And if you need to prove it to yourself, uh, hold up your thumb again at arm's length and pretend that you are, well, look at your thumb. And now look off to one side. And what I think you'll find is though, even though the thumb has not moved in the real world, it will have moved uh, on your retina. It's now off to one side in the retinas of both your left and right eye. So the picture, the proximal stimulus that we receive, the image <coughs> on, <coughs> on the retinas has changed. Yet we normally would say, yeah, that's a stable world and the thumb hasn't moved at all. So how does that happen? Well, it turns out that our visual systems compensate for eye movements so that the world does not appear to move when the eyes move. So again, when the eyes move, the entire world moves across the retina, but we normally do not perceive that as motion. We say, aha, there is a stable world out there. So there must be some form of compensation. And this diagram illustrates what I was trying to do with my uh, thumb. Uh, if we have a thumb and we move our eyeball, then the image of the thumb will move, it will be displaced across the uh, surface of the retina to some new location. Uh, in fact, we can uh, imagine something similar being caused by true objective motion of the thumb. So if we have our thumb here and then move it, so here's my thumb and I'm going to move it now, well, I can get the same change in the image uh, of the thumb on the retina, uh, but now it's caused by true objective real world motion. Uh, so the visual system is really good at distinguishing those two cases. And in the case where the objective world is not moving at all, well, we end up seeing a stationary objective world. So it, the way to understand what is going on is to make your eyes move in a way to which they're not accustomed. And the simplest way to do that is to jiggle your eyeball. So if you'd all for a moment cover up one of your eyes, this is actually a fun one, uh, cover up your eyes and now very gently start jiggling the other eye on its corner, gently. And if you do this right, you should see the whole world shake. How many people see the whole world shake? Good. So that is the motion of the eyeball that is not being compensated for. And the reason it's not being compensated for is that the eyeball is moving because of the, well, the pushing, uh, rather than by the voluntary movements of the muscles which control the eye position. So normally uh, our brains send commands to the muscles of the eye saying, please move here, please move there. These are voluntary movements of the eye. And in those cases, the visual system compensates for the motion of the eye. When we now use an external force to cause the eye to move, as in the case of our jiggling, well, the visual system is not able to compensate for that. So voluntary eye movements involve not only signals to the eye muscles, but also feedback signals. And these help us compensate for uh, the motions of the eye uh, and make the world appear stable. So. If we have our eyes move in the normal fashion, there are feedback signals that help keep the world stable. And that's really uh, an important finding. It goes back over 100 years uh, to Helmholtz and it's still a current idea in uh, neuroscientific research. That we have feedback uh, when we cause something to move. Now let's see. This is something for which I am afraid I have no pictures. Induced motion, that will be our last little topic on visual motion processing. Induced motion <clears throat> is best appreciated through examples that I can't recreate in the classroom. So for example, let's say it's nighttime and we have a moon up in the sky and it's behind some clouds. So you can see the moon through some clouds. These clouds are moving along 
<clears throat> Has anybody ever had the feeling that it is the moon that is moving along and the clouds that are staying still? Okay, so that is a misattribution of motion. In fact, it's the wind blowing the clouds along and so they are moving. The moon is staying still. That's the truth of the matter, but oftentimes we see the reverse. It looks as though the clouds, which take, a, take up a much larger part of the visual image, looks as though they are staying still. They're effectively acting as the stable background and this little light then ends up being perceived as moving. So we misattribute uh, the motion. So there's induced motion in that case and that is the motion of the moon, which is entirely uh, illusory. Now a second example uh, you can do in a car or on a train and so I've experienced this driving a, a car on a freeway and you come to a traffic jam and you're just sitting there in your car, traffic is not moving. Has this ever happened to anybody where you're just sitting there not moving? It's really, uh, okay. So traffic standstill. So what happens sometimes is that you f begin to feel that your car is drifting towards the car in front of you and you're about to hit the person right in front even though your foot is on the brake. How many people have had that happen? That's happened to me, so I'm just sort of sitting there and all of a sudden I stamp on the brake even harder than my foot was already on it. And what is causing that is the motion of the neighboring cars and the other lanes. So if the other lanes start moving, instead of seeing those cars as moving, you feel that you yourself are moving. You misattribute the motion. You say, aha, my car is moving and you step on the brake because you're really scared. You do not want to hit the car in front. So that's an example of induced motion. Uh, the classic example is in a train uh, and if you're a passenger in a train and you have a nice window, well, what happens when you're at a station? You're sitting still, the train is not moving, but sometimes there are trains on the tracks uh, neighboring you and if they start to move, Instead of seeing those trains moving, you might instead feel that you yourself are moving and you'll say, aha, I'm in the train, I'm moving. In fact, it's this train next door that's moving. Again, a case of induced motion, illusory motion caused by the motion of something else. So that's very interesting. So uh, motion perception. I am now going to shift topics and talk a little bit about uh, visual neuroscience and perception, as promised. And I want to remind you of the pathways leading up to primary visual cortex, uh, area V1 first, and then second we'll take a detailed look at some of the processing going on. So, uh, in the retina, again we have uh, light reaching the retinal surface, passing through uh, largely transparent cells and finally reaching the outer segments of rods and cones where we find discs with various photopigments. For the rods, the photopigment is rhodopsin. Uh, the retinal component of the rhodopsin molecule is able to change shape when it absorbs a photon and this change in shape leads to a hyperpolarization of the rod which is then signaled to bipolar cells and thence to ganglion cells and then via the optic nerve up into the brain. So it turns out that there are several different kinds of retinal ganglion cells. Two of these kinds are pictured here and uh, they're called parvo cells and magno cells and these briefly mean small and large and at any one point in the retina uh, you'll find parvo and magno retinal ganglion cells and you'll be able to compare them at this point in the retina. You'll say, yeah, here, the, here is a smaller ganglion cell, here is a larger ganglion cell and that's where they get their name, names from. They're two distinct populations, the small guys and the big guys. And it turns out that the way that they process information from bipolar cells and photoreceptors uh, differs and that the neurons that they project to eventually all the way up in area V1 differ. So they play different roles in the processing of visual information. So here's a small table. Uh, the parvo cells are this column. The magno cells are the right column. 
And you can see that, well, these cells, these retinal ganglion cells differ anatomically. The parvos are small and there's a large number of them. Uh, the magnos, on the other hand, are large cells, relatively speaking, and they're in the minority. They also differ physiologically. So if you uh, look at the uh, responses of the parvo cells to uh, changes in light, you'll find that they have relatively slower responses that are sustained so that if you shine a light in the receptive field of a parvo cell, as soon as that light uh, is turned on, well, you'll find that you get, in, for instance, an increase in the firing rate of this cell that continues as long as the light is on. Finally, uh, the action potentials will stop when you turn off the light. So as long as that light is shining in the receptive field, this cell is responding. It has a sustained response. Magnos, on the other hand, they will respond rapidly and transiently. That means they're signaling uh, really the change more than they are the steady state. So if we shine a light in the receptive field of a magno retinal ganglion cell, we will find that when we turn that light on, we'll get a nice increase in uh, the firing rate, but it's a very uh, short-term thing. Uh, very quickly, uh, the magno cell will return to its resting state. It stops responding to that light, even though the light is still shining in its receptive field. So it provides a transient response. Number of parvo cells are color sensitive. Uh, Magno cells tend to have a very high sensitivity to black-white patterns and to moving things. <coughs> and people figure, well, uh, they seem to differ in their function. Parvo cells help us with the processing of visual form and color information. The magno cells help us with the processing of temporal motion and depth information. And a lot of this comes from uh, how they're wired up. Uh, downstream, namely higher up in the brain. So we'll get there and see where they go. Where do they go? Well, we've seen this uh, last time. We know that the retinal ganglion cells project via the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate nuclei on either side of the brain. <clears throat> and the retinal ganglion cell axons cross in a way that makes certain that the left side of the visual field ends up in the right side of the brain and vice versa. Uh, Neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus project in turn uh, to several areas, including notably primary visual cortex, area V1, on the same side of the head. So again, we have a contralateral organization here. One side of the visual field is processed by neurons on the other side of the brain. That's the important thing. The optic chiasm, that's the word for uh, where the various retinal ganglion cell axons cross so that one side of the visual field is represented by neurons on the other side of the brain. And the optic chiasm is this crossing point here, that X. Uh, it's also known as the optic decussation. I think I've seen that, seen that term also. So, The lateral geniculate nucleus uh, receives information from both eyes. And again, they're specialized for halves of the visual field. And this is true also for uh, neurons in primary visual cortex. And I believe we've had this picture before. Uh, I don't think we've had this, though. If we look at lateral geniculate nucleus through a microscope and we use the uh, purple stain for uh, cell bodies, the initial stain, then we'll find that the lateral geniculate nucleus has layers. Uh, and it turns out that the sort of top four layers, indicated by these arrows here, uh, are innervated by parvocellular retinal ganglion cells. <clears throat> these two bottom layers are innervated by magnocellular retinal ganglion cells. And using auto radiography, you can determine which uh, cells are innervated by ganglion cells from which eye. And it turns out that these layers uh, also differ by where, which eye they get their information from. 
And that is shown more clearly on this next slide. So if we have the left eye and the right eye <clears throat> and we consider the magnocellular and parvocellular retinal ganglion cells, these can either be same side, ipsilateral, and that's that little I, or the opposite side, contralateral, and that's that little C. So we have ipsilateral and contralateral magnocellular and parvocellular retinal ganglion cells in the left eye and in the right eye, and this is where they connect to in lateral geniculate nucleus in the left eye and the right eye. And the important information I think to take home from this is that uh, yes, both lateral geniculate nuclei receive information from both eyes, the left and the right, and both lateral geniculate nuclei receive information from the magnocellular and the parvocellular retinal ganglion cells. And this is the precise organization. So the neurons in lateral geniculate nucleus project to primary visual cortex. There is a term for primary visual cortex that's sort of out of favor at this moment, particularly for primates and humans, and that is striate cortex, which refers to stripes that you can see in primary visual cortex of certain species. Uh, but if you see the term striate cortex, they're just talking about V1. And here's an old diagram from Polyak way back in the 50s, uh, effectively showing the optic radiation, which is the projection from neurons in lateral geniculate nucleus up to primary visual cortex V1. Uh, so it turns out that visual processing doesn't stop with neurons in V1. There are what are known as extra striate areas, extra striate beyond striate cortex, sort of the next stage, and these engage in visual processing as well. And some of the uh, lower stages of extra striate visual information processing are carried out in what are termed visual areas two, three, four, and five. So that's V2, V3, V4, and V5. And V5 in some species is called MT, and in our species it's called human MT. So if I were to say this for humans, it would be V2, V3, V4, and human MT, V5. Uh, and these are all areas of the brain that are very close, at the back of the head, very close to area V1 that are processing visual information. And we sort of want to know what all of these things are doing to help us see. So what about V1? Let's see where the neurons go there. Hmm. Different neurons in visual cortex respond to different aspects of a stimulus. Oh, well that makes sense. Well, we already know one thing, which is that for each point in the visual field, we have different neurons responding. So if I look straight ahead, then I have neurons that are looking straight ahead, but I also have neurons responding to my hand off to the side or up here or down there. In effect, I have neurons looking in all directions. Uh, we also know uh, that there is uh, orientation selectivity in some neurons in primary visual cortex so that at each point in the visual field, I have some neurons looking for vertical edges and some neurons looking for horizontal edges. And that's true not only for the part of the visual field that is straight ahead, but also for those things off to the side or up above or down below. Uh, so at each moment in time, we have a very large number of neurons sensitive to different things in different regions of the visual field. So these different analyses go on in parallel, and that's what this means. Effectively, at all locations in the visual field, you have all of this stuff going on at the same time, in parallel. So this is parallel processing of visual information. Uh, it turns out not only do we have neurons of differing orientation sensitivity, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, stuff like that. We also have cells that are analyzing motion. Others are analyzing color. We also have some uh, disparity sensitive cells. There are all sorts of things that neurons uh, in visual cortex are sensitive to. Uh, 
Now it turns out in primary visual cortex, neurons are organized spatially according to the visual field locations of their receptive fields. And this is called retinotopy. And uh, effectively, neurons have receptive fields laid out retinotopically so that the sensitivity to visual field directions changes smoothly as one moves across visual cortex. So we have neurons sensitive to our straight ahead direction when we look straight ahead at something and we now have to say, well, that corresponds to some neurons say at this location in the back of my head. What if I now examine the visual sensitivity of neurons just next door, maybe a little bit higher. If I just move my uh, electrode just a little bit higher than those neurons that are looking straight ahead. What sort of neurons would I find? I would find neurons that are looking very close to center but just a little bit down, just a little bit different. I would find neurons that are looking at neighboring regions of the visual field. So if I have neurons that are neighbors in visual cortex and it turns out that they are looking at neighboring regions of the visual field. And uh, that's indicated by this diagram here. This is an experiment by Roger Tutel uh, from a fairly long time ago. What uh, happened is in this experiment was that a uh, monkey was fed radioactive glucose and then shown this test pattern. And you can see it has uh, the central region and then the sectors going out into the periphery of the visual field. The monkey in this experiment is effectively forced to fixate at that central point. So what happens is that the neurons that pick up uh, this pattern uh, are more active and so they pick up more radioactive glucose so that when that monkey is sacrificed and the anatomist looks for which parts of visual cortex emit more radioactivity, this is the pattern that is found. And you can see uh, that these uh, lines are forming a fairly regular grid that looks very similar to the lines that generated them in the visual field. And what this means, uh, for example, is that this area here, let's say that's here, these neurons neighbor those neurons right here, which is, what did I say, this one here? And it's that little area here. And if we go in even farther, then we're going to get the neurons looking right there. Neurons that are neighbors in visual cortex are looking at neighboring regions of the visual field. And that's the whole principle of retinotopic mapping. Uh, one point. The second point is many more neurons in visual cortex are devoted to processing information in the center of gaze, the fovea. Far fewer neurons are devoted to peripheral visual field information processing. Uh, and you can just see how much area is assigned to the processing of the fovea. This tiny little circle right there, this tiny little circle gets all of those neurons. And that's almost as much is the neurons here which have that tremendous area of the visual field. So far more neurons are devoted to the fovea than to the periphery. Now, it turns out that uh, people and creatures suffer damage to their visual cortex and this can lead to blindness. There are various degrees of visual blindness caused by cortical damage. And it turns out that if you, for instance, more or less wipe out one side of uh, primary visual cortex, you wipe out V1 in one hemisphere, you will lose vision in an entire half of your visual field. So if I have complete damage to V1 on the left side of my brain, well that would be a bad thing because I would no longer be able to see anything in the right visual field. That's called a hemianopia. I've lost half the visual field. Uh, far more common is loss of function in a localized region of primary visual cortex, in which case you'll sort of get a spot where there is no vision. That's called a scotoma. Uh, you can also get a scotoma 
or at least partial from retinal damage. Uh, now let's see, quadrantinopia, so you can have uh, uh, lesion isolated to something that would give you loss of an upper right visual field, for example. So you lose a quadrant of the visual field. In any event, uh, retinotopic mapping sort of helps us understand why you might get these sorts of lesions as a result, excuse me, these sorts of deficits as a result of these lesions shown here on the left. This would not be happening if it weren't for the retinotopic mapping of visual information. So what are these pieces of cortex doing for us? Well, remember that uh, we're now talking about gray matter on the surface of the brain, the cortex, the peel, the rind of the brain. And it's gray matter, so we find a large number of cell bodies. Uh, and we're going to focus on a neuron cells that we find there. When we look in area V1, uh, people conventionally find six layers of cells. And with initial stain, again, we're looking for nuclear material. Uh, it ends up being a sort of dark purple color. And we can see in particular this very dark band here. You can see this line of demarcation right about there, further lines of demarcation. Uh, you can see this very thin layer right at the outermost surface of cortex, one. And you can see the deepest layer of cortex here, six. If we were to look down here, sort of underneath six, layer six, what would we find? White matter. Okay, this is the surface of the brain, layer one, two, three, four, five, six, underneath here, well that's all white matter. This is all the axons. So this is what happens if you use a initial stain. Cytochrome oxidase is another uh, stain, makes things look sort of orangish, reddish. And you can see uh, layers a little bit differently using this stain. Six, five, uh, four C, the other two fours. Uh, one looks pretty distinct from two and three here. Uh, so yes, there are a variety of ways uh, to try to figure out the identity and people conventionally find six layers. Uh, the neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus have axons that project via the optic radiation to primary visual cortex. The primary inputs from lateral geniculate nucleus arrive in layer 4C. And it turns out there are two sublayers, 4C alpha and 4C beta. And if you look at where the magnocellular neurons in lateral geniculate nucleus arrive, it's 4C alpha. There's those black spots here, those neurons. And if you see where the parvocellular uh, neurons in lateral geniculate nucleus arrive in primary visual cortex, it's 4C beta. They uh, terminate on these cells here. So these effectively are continuing the parvo and magno pathways uh, which continue uh, throughout the uh, early stages of visual processing. Now, uh, the magno layers uh, project from 4C alpha to layer 4B and then they just leave primary visual cortex entirely. So in the retina we have the magno cells, these project to the magno layers in lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, they project then to 4C alpha neurons. They then go to neurons in 4B and those neurons in 4B then send their information to V2, which is one of those extra striate visual areas that we talked about before and we'll talk about again shortly. And it turns out that they send information to what are known as the thick stripes in area V2. And that's it for the magno pathways in primary visual cortex. Uh, as far as the parvos go, there's a considerably more processing and there's an important thing going on in terms of color vision. There are structures revealed by cytochrome oxidase staining known as blobs. And these blobs are effectively columns, sort of regularly spaced across the surface of primary visual cortex. And these blobs are where you find cells that are processing color information. If you look at neurons that are not in the blobs but instead are in the interblob spaces, 
then you do not find color sensitive cells, rather you find cells that are very good at analyzing form. So they're looking for edges and bars and orientations, things like that. Uh, so here is a uh, slice through the surface of visual cortex where we can see these darkened spots. Those darkened spots are the blobs where you find color sensitive cells. And it's very hard to see them here I'm afraid but relying on this picture at least you can see yes we have these little blob zones that appear darker uh, when stained with cytochrome oxidase. And this is work by Margaret Wong Riley. So here is the schematic. The uh, blobs are receiving input from the parvocellular layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus and that would be indicated by these red and green inputs here and we follow these 4C beta and then these guys in turn project to neurons in shallower layers like layers two and three in the blobs. Uh, this differs from the uh, magnocellular layer neurons in the LGN which project to uh, 4C alpha and then exit very quickly. Now there's one thing I haven't mentioned. These are the coniocellular layers of the LGN. These are effectively, let me go back here to LGN. Coniocellular uh, layers are effectively these white stripes. And people thought at first there wasn't any action there. But it turns out that there are some very small cells and what they are doing is processing information from the short wavelength sensitive cones, blueness. So if you want to see anything having to do with the color blue and the color yellow, then you want the cells in these coniocellular layers uh, to be active. And they are indicated in our present slide, jumping ahead to, oh, there it is. Here, the coniocellular layers of the LGN providing short wavelength sensitive photoreceptoral information also uh, effectively uh, lead to neurons in the blobs where we have processing of color. So if we trace this out in more detail, 4C beta, which is where the parvocellular layers of LGN terminate, uh, these neurons project to shallow layers two and three and thence uh, we have projection to extra striate areas including V2, V3 and V4. You're probably wondering about these deep layers. Well, layers five and six not only receive input from the superior colliculus, which is in the midbrain or mesencephalon, and which is sort of a uh, secondary area where retinal ganglion cells project. Uh, they receive some input from superior colliculus and LGN. It turns out they also project back to these areas. It turns out that lateral geniculate nucleus is not just a way station that works in one direction. It doesn't work retina, lateral geniculate nucleus, visual cortex. Well, it does work that way, but we have to realize now that visual cortex sends back information to lateral geniculate nucleus. So that the lateral geniculate nucleus neurons behave in a way that is modulated by the processing of neurons in visual cortex. And a lot of people think uh, that visual attention, uh, which involves cortical neurons, uh, modulates the activity of lateral geniculate neurons via pathways uh, such as this right here. Uh, projection back from these deep layers uh, to LGN and superior colliculus. So. Uh, we've talked about magno and parvo pathways in primary visual cortex. The other primary way uh, that cells differ in LGN is by, well, the eye. Are they receiving their input from the left eye or are they receiving their input from the right eye? If we now trace connections from right and left eye layers from LGN up to V1, we find that, well, uh, the signals from each eye are segregated and go to what are known as different ocular dominance columns in area V1. Uh, 
And what we have here is the surface of V1 done in a way that indicates which eye provides inputs to the neurons in V1. And I forget if it's the left eye is the black or the right eye is the black. Uh, doesn't really matter. Let's suppose that the right eye is providing the inputs to all of the neurons in these black areas and the left eye is providing inputs to all the neurons in the white areas. Uh, that's effectively what is being shown here. The ocular dominance columns or which neurons in visual cortex are receiving inputs from which eyes. And this is across the entire surface of visual cortex with the fovea over here and the periphery over here on the left. So this is work by Simon LeVay. And you can sort of imagine how you might do this experiment. What you could do is feed an animal radioactive glucose. Uh, you can then stimulate one eye and not the other. And then you can see where the areas of greatest uptake are and you will get a pattern of stripes showing those neurons receiving input from the eye receiving stimulation. Uh, and what you'll find is a pattern like this, the zebra stripe pattern of ocular dominance columns. Now, <clears throat> it turns out uh, that receiving input uh, from one eye or the other is not all or none. So when I look at a diagram like this, I might be misled into thinking, well, if a neuron is in a black stripe area, then it's receiving input from the right eye only. If a neuron is in this white stripe area, then it's receiving input from the left eye only. And the answer is, well, that's not quite accurate. Turns out that if you are in the center of a black stripe area, then yes, that's true. If you are in the center of a white stripe area, then yes, that's true. But if you are near the border of, say, a black and a white zone, a right eye and a left eye zone, then in fact you receive inputs from both eyes so that there are cells in primary visual cortex that are binocular in their sensitivity. They have inputs from both the left and the right eye. So these are the ocular dominance columns, but this should not blind us to the fact uh, that in fact there are many cells in primary visual cortex which have binocular sensitivities. Cells that respond to signals from only one eye are monocular. Cells receiving inputs from both eyes are binocular. One further thing. We talked about orientation selectivity. Lots of cells in visual cortex are interested in bars and edges and they're very sensitive to the orientation of that bar or edge. And it turns out that as you move across the surface of visual cortex, you'll find an orderly progression in orientation selectivity in the preferred orientation of neurons. So what we have here is a plot of what we measure as we slowly move an electrode across the surface of cortex, poking one neuron after another. When you have an electrode, a microelectrode, and you're moving it along the surface of cortex, poking one neuron after another, you're, this is effectively a track. And you can move the electrode along that track, and this horizontal axis is showing the track distance in millimeters. So it looks as though this particular electrode is moved more two millimeters or so across the surface of cortex. We now can measure for each neuron that we approach with our microelectrodes tip, we can now measure its orientation selectivity. What is its preferred orientation? Is it horizontal, uh, 90 degrees? Is it vertical, zero degrees? Or is it something else, maybe this 30 degrees tilted uh, orientation? What we do is plot uh, orientation selectivity as a function of track position and we get a nice smooth change. And that's what happens. Effectively, uh, neighboring orientations are represented by neighboring neurons. And we have this uh, very regular change in orientation sensitivity as we move across cortex. So what people realize is that for 
effectively each location in the visual field, uh, we have to have input from both eyes and we've got to have all possible orientations being represented and people started wondering how that's possible. Well one way is shown here and that is for orientation selectivity which is indicated for vertical, tilted, horizontal and then back again. For orientation selectivity to vary in one dimension as you move across visual cortex and for uh, ocular dominance, left, right, left, right, left, right to vary in the other dimension. So that effectively you can have two different things going on at once by virtue of the fact that, well, primary visual cortex is a two-dimensional surface. Uh, so this is an ice cube model of cortex showing for some small region of the visual field ocular dominance columns. And these are the different colors uh, being more or less uh, perpendicular to variation in the orientation selectivity of neurons. And this led people to the idea that there is a hyper column. For each point in the visual field, you need neurons that are sensitive to the left eye, you need neurons that are sensitive to the right eye, and for both of those eyes neurons, you need to be sensitive to each possible orientation for bars and edges. And this shows uh, left eye information here, right eye information there, and for both of those you get a uh, complete change in orientation selectivity. So complete processing of eye and orientation at one point in the visual field. And this is a concept that sprang out of the uh, studies of Hubel and Wiesel and other people back in the 1960s. Uh, it's been updated somewhat in this diagram, which is also effectively showing a hyper column. Here we have left eye neurons in that uh, stripe here, right eye sensitive neurons in that stripe there, and we have blobs, interblobs. We have the variation in orientation selectivity for our form sensitive neurons and we have the various inputs that these neurons receive uh, from LGN. So this is sort of an updated schematic for a hypercolumn, taking into account the presence of uh, blobs. <sighs> Pretty complicated, huh? Now you probably are wondering, I know I am, what about those extra striate visual areas? Well, we know that there are uh, motion and depth sensitive magnocellular pathway neurons projecting to area uh, V2. And we also know that there are color sensitive neurons projecting to V2 and it turns out there are form ones also. So this is our area V1 that we've been looking at. CO means cytochrome oxidase and this is a blob that dark orange guy here. Uh, interpatch is where there is no blob. And it turns out that the blob neurons which are specialized for processing color information, these project to areas in V2 known as the thin stripe areas. Uh, neurons uh, as part of the uh, form pathway are projecting to, oh well I'll sh I skipped something. This is a slice of V2 and I hope you're able to see thin stripe, thick stripe, thin stripe, thick stripe, thin stripe, thick and then there's spaces in between. And so when you look at V2 in this fashion you'll find that there are thick stripes, thin stripes and tail stripes. And that's what this diagram is trying to show. And we look at which particular neurons are going where. Uh, we get lots of input from V1. The thin stripes are receiving the information from the blobs, that's color. Motion information is passed to neurons in the thick stripes and uh, so that makes this part of the magnocellular pathway motion. And finally the interstripes where there weren't any stripes, well that's where the form processing neurons 
uh, projects. So you can see down here, uh, here's a part of V2. Uh, here's another part of V2. Turns out that neurons in V2 project to V3, V4, and MT. And these have their own properties. V3 receives input from both V1 and V2. It has two retinotopic maps of the foveal region. Uh, so you might speak of two subregions inside of V3. It's specialized for detailed visual processing, particularly moving forms, but there is some color and some depth sensitivity. V4. One of the most interesting things about V4 is that people found that if V4 is damaged uh, in a human, then that human often will be unable to see color. So the world turns into this sort of muddy black and white thing. Uh, so people naturally said, well, V4 must be specialized for the processing of color information. And indeed, it receives lots of information, lots of input from V2 thin stripes, which we know to receive information from blob cells in V1, sensitive to color. Uh, cerebral achromatopsia is effectively, well, uh, the condition where uh, damage to the cerebrum, likely in area V4, uh, causes loss of color perception. If we look at the sizes of receptive fields of cells uh, there, we find that they are relatively large. And people think that, and they don't really know what neurons in V4 are doing, but they think that V4 helps us perceive color surfaces and pay attention to these. Now let's see. V5 is also called MT or human MT for humans. And it's a little bit tougher to damage V5 in the way you can V4. You can see V4 is actually on the outer surface of the cortex. So it's a little bit more prone to damage. Uh, MT is now tucked inside one of these folds here. So it's a little bit tougher to get a systematic damage to MT or V5. But somebody who does suffer from such damage is unable to see motion. And that condition is known as cerebral akinetopsia. What does movement look like to such people? Well, you know, if somebody were to start waving their hand in the audience, what I would see is a smooth wave. I wouldn't be able to say, uh, you know, exactly uh, where the arm is at each moment in time, but I would see, yes, it's moving. It stopped, it moves, it stops again, it moves again, and I'm seeing this smooth motion as I wave it back and forth. A person with cerebral akinetopsia would not see the smooth motion. They'd see this sort of stop frame action. Bink, 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 bink. They might get, you know, different frames, and they'd say, yes, uh, I'm seeing the arm in different positions, but I'm not seeing motion. I'm seeing, simply seeing it as though it were the frames of a movie rather than seeing a nice smooth motion. Uh, does that make sense? It's as though you're seeing a really, really er early movie where there uh, weren't enough frames each second. So you're seeing And that's what a person with cerebral echinotopsia sees. Uh, no smooth motion. So. Again, we have neurons with fairly large receptive fields. Uh, and these, again, are very sensitive to motions of things. They receive their inputs from V2 thick stripes. And we know that these receive uh, inputs from the magnocellular pathway neurons in primary visual cortex. Now, people have uh, generalized uh, processing beyond primary visual cortex according to function. And it turns out that people have found that there are basically two pathways for the processing of visual information. These are known as the where pathway and there are effectively areas in parietal uh, cortex that are processing information concerning where a visual stimulus is. There's also the what visual pathway. And uh, people have found that there are areas in the temporal lobes 
uh, processing information concerning what it is somebody's looking at, helping us recognize objects in the visual field. So these are known as the what and the where pathways, and both of them rely on the activity of neurons in the occipital lobe, of course, the primary visual cortex and some of these extra striate visual areas. But the further processing of location information is handled by neurons in parietal visual areas. The further processing of object identity is uh, handled by neurons in temporal cortical areas. That would be the what pathway. So here is a slightly more detailed diagram and we have uh, activity in primary visual cortex producing activity in V2 and then we have a split between uh, what are the continuations of the magnocellular pathway which started all the way in the retinal ganglion cells. Remember magno? Well, that's these blue arrows now going to area MT which is for motion processing. Uh, then the lateral uh, infraparietal area LIP uh, which helps integrate visual motion and other sorts of positional information including Vestibul uh, vestibular senses and sensory motor things, stuff along those lines. So this pathway helps us with spatial processing and prepares us for action, namely moving our arms, legs, moving around in the world, achieving goals of that sort. Area V2 also has neurons that project primarily to V4 and thence to pari uh, posterior uh, infrotemporal cortex central and then anterior infrotemporal cortex and you'll find neurons here that are sensitive, apparently sensitive to classes of different objects, people, trees, cars, cats, etc. Uh, and are so helping us with object recognition. Uh, and so the temporal lobe is helping us with object recognition here. So the what pathway involves temporal lobe areas. The where pathway involves parietal lobe areas. I should note that the, uh, a lot of these areas are multimodal. And what that means in this context is that they receive, the neurons in these areas receive information from more than just visual neurons. For instance, they sometimes receive information from auditory system neurons, from somatosensory neurons and uh, from vestibular sense neurons in the case of some of these uh, parietal areas. Uh, so some of these areas are not wholly visual by the time you reach the uh, outer stretches of the what and where streams. They're typically multimodal, receiving information from all the senses. What do you think of this diagram? If you want to memorize how things are laid out in the early stages of visual processing, well this is a great diagram for doing it. Uh, if you don't want to memorize it, that's okay. Just remember what and where. What temporal, where parietal. But this shows you, you know, you start way back in the retina with the parvocellular and the magnocellular cells and you then project to different layers of neurons in the LGN which go to different places in primary visual cortex and there you have blobs for color and interblobs for form and then you have different projections to V2 depending upon whether it's color or form or motion and of course the thick stripe, the motion fellows go to area MT and thence to higher order areas for uh, location processing and other forms of spatial processing. The color and form information projects uh, primarily to V4 and thence uh, to the what visual processing areas in temporal lobe. Uh, people knew this a fairly long time ago. This is uh, from 1992 which is now 20 years ago and uh, this sort of, uh, if you were to take cortex and flatten it, these are effectively the areas that you would find that we've just talked about in a uh, macaque monkey Here's area V1 receiving projections from LGN and uh, from the uh, retinas. Then you have areas V2, V3, blah, blah, blah. Here you have the uh, what pathway effectively in blue. Uh, 
and you have the wear pathway in this orangish yellowish color. And that's fairly complicated and it's even worse if you look and see how these areas are connected to one another. And I would like a hundred word essay on this due tomorrow. No, just kidding. <laughs> this was 1991. In fact, this is way simplified compared to what people now know. Uh, and this is how all these little areas are connected. You can trace the axons going from say V3 to 7B, VIP, all of those crazy places. So it's a little bit tough and I think people have uh, really made a lot of progress in getting uh, this sort of more systematic interpretation of how visual information flows in cortex uh, compared to this wiring diagram here. That's the progress uh, people make. It's figuring out what this really means. Okay, visual object recognition now. Getting on towards the uh, final part of this lecture. And you have to wonder, how are results determined by different systems bound together to give us a single unified object? Because by now you should have in your mind a notion whereby there are some neurons that are helping us to see, say, edges. So if I look at a person, well, that person will have a contour. There will be edge information. But there are other neurons that are sensitive to color. So some neurons are going to help us with green, some with red, some with blue, some with yellow. Uh, if that person is moving their arm, I'd like to see that person you know, move their arm. How is it that we put all of these sources of visual information together from the responses of different neurons in different parts of the brain? So that problem is the binding problem. And it's still sort of an open question. There are some people who say, well, neurons that are firing synchronously indicating that they have information concerning the same object. So neurons that fire together get grouped together in some sense. It sounds like one of these gestalt grouping principles. Uh, it doesn't really explain uh, how uh, they end up firing synchronously or how this gets decoded is, well, firing concerning the same object, but it's a nice idea. So let's see, visual object recognition, uh, there's also a lot of thinking on the fact that objects frequently are seen as having parts and that perhaps we can take the complicated uh, task of recognizing a complicated shape and break it down into a simpler task of recognizing individual parts. And then if we end up seeing a head, two arms, a torso, and two legs, then we can put those parts together and say, oh, I must be seeing a human. So that style of thinking is pretty old, at least uh, back to the 1980s. And uh, Mara Nishihara, for example, what they did is for object re recognition, they supposed that in fact what we try to do is recognize parts that these parts are generalized cylinders. And here you can see a giraffe that is made out of generalized cylinders. Here you can see a human that is made out of generalized cylinders. They didn't really have any ideas on how you could recognize these component cylinders or how you could put them together. Uh, it turns out that there is a, uh, let me, I'll hold off on that. Anyway, this is an early idea, generalized cylinders. Here's a second early idea that's due to a fellow uh, up at uh, USC named Irv Biederman. Uh, again, you know, from the 80s or so. And he said that things are divided up into geons. Now you probably don't know what a geon is because, well, he made that up. And what he said is that, well, there are these elementary shapes and these elementary shapes give us a shape alphabet. And the letters in the shape alphabet are effectively called geons and there might be 20 or 30 of them. I'm not certain how many there are. It all sort of depends on what the Biederman folks say is a geon what, and what is not a geon. So it's a little bit arbitrary. Uh, so there might be, you know, a particular thing we see out there and it has a football as a part of its shape. Or we might be looking at a rhinoceros and there might be a horn that we have as part of a shape. Or there might be a wine glass shape. Now it seems like a fairly complicated thing to have as part of an elementary shape alphabet, but there we are. These are geons. Uh, 
Uh, people don't think this way anymore. I see a hand. Well, you could decompose it. In yeah. fact, you'd say there's this bit, then there's a straight a stem, and then there's the goblet part. And in fact, Don Hoffman is professor of cognitive sciences here at UCI. He uh, works uh, in an office very close to mine. And as part of his early work on visual processing, again around 1980 or so, he worked with his uh, graduate advisor, Whitman Richards, on a theory of how we decompose the contours of a complex object into constituent parts. And effectively, wherever you find a uh, concavity in the contour, that indicates a break. So this is a concavity in the contour. That right over here is a concavity in the contour. That means you should break this off and to make it its own part, namely the bottom of the glass. This is a concavity, that is a concavity. Make a break here and you now have all three parts of that wine glass. So that's Don Hoffman who came up with that idea. Uh, people don't think about this uh, the way they do, uh, did back then. Some of the best work on visual object recognition it actually comes from computer vision people. And you know what they really want to do is have a camera that is attached to a computer recognize things. Uh, and you know, if you have a, a video camera uh, attached to a computer that helps you label things in your video as humans, cars, trucks, buses, trees, think how excited Google would get. I mean, you know, Google's trying to grab up all the information in the world. If they were now able to take all the YouTube videos and to figure out what exactly is being seen there. Now, wouldn't that be cool? They could then run face recognition stuff also and figure out who's in the YouTube videos. In any event, people want computers to be able to recognize visual objects. And the most successful approaches uh, are using machine learning methods. And these are effectively statistical methods uh, that take visual input patterns and try to classify these according to the object uh, that is being visualized. Uh, in any event, some of these modern uh, machine learning techniques are uh, quite successful and there's a uh, method in particular by a fellow named Felsenswab that tries to recognize complex objects based on their constituent parts. So the idea here and the idea here, you might think of in terms of, well, it's generalized cylinders or it's geons. No. One of the basic ideas to come out of this early work is that uh, being able to identify parts can help us identify the entire object. So if I see the wheel and tire of a car, I might infer that, yes, I'm seeing a car, not just the wheel and the tire. Uh, this Felsenswab uh, has a, uh, systematic way of uh, recognizing things based on their parts. So when we get back to perception, it's important to note that there are people who are unable to recognize objects and so suffer from visual agnosia. And we should note that there are two forms of visual agnosia. First, apperceptive agnosia cannot recognize by shape, cannot copy drawings. Such people often have prospignosia, which is face blindness. Uh, they will effectively look you right in the face. They will not see your face. They see something, but it's not your face. They're unable to recognize a person from their face. Uh, now, Somebody with associative agnosia can copy a picture, but they cannot recognize what it is, and they have difficulty transferring visual information to verbal descriptions. So talking about what they see simply is no good. Uh, both forms are typically associated with brain trauma. Not a big surprise, typically to temporal lobe structures. Visual agnosia. Face processing. Now this is what's known as the Thatcher illusion. And one of the things that people like about the Thatcher illusion 
is that it shows how weird face processing is. Now, when you look at the face upside down, this looks like a normal face to me. It's only when it's turned right side up that we realize that it's a little bit monstrous. So that's a pleasant looking upside down face, but unfortunately the eyes are upside down and the lips and mouth are also upside down. Okay, so that's why it looks so horrible here because they cut out the eyes and they put them upside down, they cut out the mouth and upside down. So they're actually right side up when the face is inverted. So when the face is upside down like there, we don't notice these gross changes that have been made to the picture. Namely, we've cut out the little eye pieces and we've turned them upside down. Check this one out. Here's our president. Looks perfectly fine to me. Oh no. That's what we had on the left side. Again, the eyes are cut out and turned upside down. The mouth is cut out and turned upside down. Look how horrible that is. That's just horrible. But do we notice this in that picture? No. Almost nobody notices that that operation has been performed when we view our president's picture upside down. Uh, so that is an example of what's known as the Thatcher illusion. Now why is it called the Thatcher illusion? There was a prime minister in England a long time ago uh, named Margaret Thatcher. And the uh, visual scientist who came up with this illusion didn't like her. So he used her face as the example for the Thatcher illusion. <laughs> uh, it's that simple. So what this shows is that the way we process face information is not straightforward and that the uh, parts of the face play a key role because we're able to do things to these parts and recognize a person based on those parts even when the parts are globally configured improperly such as in this picture here. The inverted face illusion is another fun one. This is a plastic mask. You know the kind you put on your face for Halloween. This is a plastic mask. This happens to be Charlie Chaplin. Now the mask is facing us. Now it's facing away. And in both cases, when it's facing us and when it's facing away, it looks as though the mask is facing out towards us. The nose is pointing towards us. Boom, the nose is pointing towards us. The people see when the mask is inside out that the nose is actually looking as though it's coming out of the picture towards us. Okay, that's an illusion. When the mask is inverted, it still looks like the head is facing us. And that is an illusion. Uh, so our brains are clearly somehow wired through experience to see facial information as belonging to a 3D surface that's coming out towards us. It's very hard to see that inside out mask is facing away from us, which is the objective truth. So experience says all the face information is uh, effectively convex facing towards us. People again place a lot of weight on the processing of neurons in the fusiform face area. And again, a lot of this work was done by Nancy Canwisher, who's now at MIT. And in this particular experiment, when people are viewing a face, you can find a functional MRI uh, activation of neurons uh, shown in yellow, indicated by this cross hairs in these three slices and fusiform face area. You get a different region of the brain activated when you view a car. And it's evidence of this sort that leads people to think that the fusiform face area may be specialized for viewing faces, helping us recognize different individuals. And we are social creatures. Recognizing faces is very important to us. And so it makes sense that there should be uh, a number of neurons in the brain uh, processing visual information concerning faces and also in our memory systems helping us recognize faces that we've already seen. So uh, people believe further that damage to this area, so if there's a lesion to the fusiform face area, well that's what causes prospignosia, face blindness. We're going to finish up today with a few impossible figures. Let me see what time it is very quickly. Time is 9.50. We have five minutes. Good. Here are two impossible figures. This one's uh, the devil's tuning fork. Uh, 
And I hope you'll see why this is an impossible figure. If you concentrate on just the left end of this diagram, I think you'd say there are three uh, cylinders, top, middle, bottom. But if you now look at the right side of this figure, I think you'll want to say there's really only two things going on. This thing coming out here and that thing coming out there. The one on the top and the one in the bottom. And you have to wonder where the one in the middle came from in the first place. Uh, this is an illusion. This also is illusory. If you follow things around, well, this is fine. We'll follow the red. Uh, we'll go up. The red is now going across here underneath and that means it's got to be on the back side of these blocks. Unfortunately, it's on the front side. So something wrong is happening. Everybody sees that this is a little bit twisted, I hope. Most people believe when examining uh, impossible figures like this that the visual system analyzes small areas of the image and tries to come up with some interpretation. It then takes up these local interpretations, say from here, 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 and here, and tries to make a global percept out of these. So if we look locally, we'd say there's three bars on the left. If we look locally over here, we'd say there's two bars. And so when we put it all together, we now say here's an object with three bars on the left and only two on the right. When we look here, each corner looks okay. If you can sort of block out all the corners but this top left one, you'd say, yeah, that's fine. This one down here at the bottom left is fine. The one in the bottom right is fine. It's only when you look at all four corners together that you have this anomalous, uh, impossible figure. So people believe that our visual systems use local information. For instance, this corner, that corner, etc. to try to infer 3D shape and you glue the local descriptions together into a global picture and you do that without checking for consistency and because that's really the only way that something like this could arise. If there were some gluing together of local interpretations that also did a consistency check, something impossible like this on the left or that guy on the right would never happen. So there must be some flaw in the consistency checking that occurs when we glue our local descriptions together. Uh, how many people have seen these Escher impossible figures? These are sort of fun. Uh, the most interesting thing in this picture is a staircase. And it's a little bit hard to see but there are some people walking up the staircase. Let's start here. These people are walking up, 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 up. They're walking up, 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 up. They're walking up, 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 up. And they're walking up, 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 up. Oh, and they return to where they started at. Now it turns out it's impossible to keep on walking uphill but then end up where you started. And you should end up higher than where you started. So that is an impossible figure. Uh, here's another Escher and if you follow this one closely, you'll see that uh, some water is going up, up, up to the top of this waterfall. It goes down and starts over again. And I hope you'll see that that is really impossible. Uh, water does not flow uphill, but apparently it does. And finally, now you have some columns in very uh, bizarre positions. In any event, people believe that uh, when it comes to uh, complex shapes of this sort, uh, the visual system works locally and then patches these together without doing a global consistency check. And that's what can lead, lead to these impossible figures. That's what I have to say today. Thank you. See you on Thursday for our final lecture on Chapter 5.